Hello everyone, my name is Brett Denman and welcome to another episode of Our High Calling. I pray this last week has been a blessed one for you as it has been for me and my family. Um, I don't know about your family, but we, uh, not so much me, but my wife and kids, they like to go to um, garage sales. They like to go to thrift stores. They like to go to these places where they think that they can find a treasure or they think they can find a good deal. And um, yeah, there's deals to be had. Um, me personally, I value my time over walking around looking for potential deals. Um, but I understand that you know it doesn't take too long of searching on the internet where you're going to find somebody who bought a painting at a garage sale for $10 and it turned out to be worth millions. Or they went to an auction and they found... I don't know, a vase that they paid $200 for, and it turned out to be worth $5 million. You're going to find stories like that. Uh, but for me personally, I just don't enjoy digging through other people's stuff and then having to um, bicker about pennies. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, something that America loves to do because you see it. Everywhere you go, especially in the summertime, in the spring, when the weather's nice, people are having garage sales out there. Churches hold garage sales where they use the money for uh, mission, mission-minded mission endeavors, which is not a bad thing, I guess. Um, it's, just, it's just not my thing. But ultimately, what I want to talk about today is about value. Uh, what do we place value on? And... When I look at the Holy Bible, I personally place a lot of value on it. When others um, look at the exact same book, maybe they don't um, put as much value on it. But I think it's because they don't understand the treasure that is found inside it. And if they understood what what is in the Bible, um, then then maybe they would change their mind. You know, if you read the, we read the Bible to be wise, and we believe the Bible to be safe, and we practice the Bible to be holy. So it's a, it's a transformation that happens uh, through that book, the Bible. Whether it's it's worn out in your home or collecting dust in another person's home, it it still has it's still treasure. It's just. How are you going to place value on it? And what I want to talk about is Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul contrasts what pagans and believers valued. And, and the thing is, is, in my own personal testimony where I came out of the world, I came out of a life of basically hedonism, um, just looking to... Uh, please myself in, in in what I eat, what I washed, what I did, everything like that was just about self. I see that when Paul starts talking about the pagans, right? Because if you start in chapter five, if you go to verse four, what did the pagans value? They valued. Well, let's read. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So. The, the pagans valued, uh, you know, trashy stories, joking, all that kind of stuff. And if you go to Ephesians 5.18, and it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So the pagans valued, you know, getting drunk, having these parties. And then they also valued things like... Uh, unmarried fornication right because remember anytime paul is rebuking this activity it's because it's happening and he's rebuking it because he's trying to teach christians that's not how we live that's not what we're about we don't place value on these fleshly things so ephesians 5 3 says but fornication and all uncleanliness uh, or covetousness let it it not be once named among you as become a saints. And, you know, 
they value those things in life. And that's what the secular world values as well. I mean, all you have to do is, is look at what's popular among those people that, that don't go to church, right? They, they value going out to eat. They value going to the bar. They go, value going to the club. They, they value trash talk. They value the, the sports ball. All these things that is, is just entertainment. It's, it's just amusement. And we can't live our life seeking amusement. There's, there's no value in it. There's no eternal value, that's for sure. And it just leads you, um, I believe, and it led me down the wrong path. There was no ultimate fulfillment because it's temporary. The things of the world, the amusements of the world, uh, what um, Paul is talking about with the pagans uh, in, in Ephesus is just temporary happiness. Because I remember whatever good time I had the night before, I paid for it the next morning uh, with a hangover, uh, with... Uh, money gone, right? It, it's expensive to do that. Funds gone. Uh, maybe I said something embarrassing or did something. So it's only temporary, but what God has to offer us is eternal. And we need to place value on things that are eternal. If you look in Ephesians 5 verse 8, it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So here we have this idea that the people that are just living in the world, they're just in darkness. They don't understand that there is a light and there's wisdom found in the Bible which sheds light on what is good and what is bad in this world. Because if you're just living for this world, then by all means, in, 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 enjoy it while you can because it, it's all you got. Remember, Moses refused to do that. Remos, Moses refused um, to, to live with the Egyptians for a season, to live like a king, to live like a prince. He would rather suffer affliction with the people of God because he knew that um, there was ultimately eternal happiness found in serving the Lord. And those people who, who do not know God, who are in darkness, it's up to us as Christians to shed light on them, right? And in Isaiah 50, verse 10, it, say, it says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Who among you walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord. Let him lean on his God. So here we have this idea that the people that are living this life, they just, they're just in darkness. They're blind to the truth. And the truth of the matter is that everybody is, is locked in to going to hell. But it's the gift of God through his son Jesus Christ who removes us from that. Because that's the fate of everybody. God isn't sending anybody to hell. You're already going. But because of what God has, Jesus did for us, we can be rescued from it. So we need to put our value, not on the worldly things. Remember, the world is trying to suck you in. The world's trying to suck you in and trying to get you to, to go along this broad way of destruction with them. Because it's the most popular route. But we need to take the narrow way and say, you know what? Ultimately, I, I value um, godly things more. I, I, I would rather put my uh, lot with the, with the children of God than, than with these pagans. And if you read in Ephesians 5 verse 9... It says, for the, fruit, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And that's in Christ. You know, if you read, uh, let's go ahead a little further ahead in, in Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, 
not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So the, the Bible basically is teaching us that those secular people who are living, you know, and you can see them go on, you know, I don't encourage you, but you know they're out there, these people that are just living um, to entertain themselves. They're, they're called fools. And it says here, the days are evil. Do we not live in evil days? Absolutely. You can't turn on the news without seeing evil. But we, we, but we can ultimately find peace and happiness in our relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing that it isn't, it isn't forever. And how do we need to walk? Listen, we don't need to be afraid. The, the nightly news makes their living off of trying to scare people. But we need to live um, with a sense of thanksgiving. Because if you are brought out of darkness and into light, if you've been shown truth, then, then you need to praise God for that. Because he just saved you from basically eternal death, and now he's given you eternal life. You know, Paul urges the believers in Ephesus to walk in love. You know, that that is um, what he's talking about in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. This walking in love, right? Ephesians 5, what is it? 5 verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So this walking in love is to be modeled after Christ's own love for us. And it's expressed in his atoning sacrifice. That's the gift that God gave us, that he took on our penalty for sin. And now we, not on our own merits, but on the merit of Christ, can enter heaven. Because without what Christ did for us, we're all doomed. This whole planet is doomed. But Paul affirms... Uh, four things about the sacrifice. If you read in uh, Ephesians 5 verse 1, it says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. So it is motivated by both love of God the Father and Christ himself. And number two, it is uh, uh, Christ is our substitute Christ died in our place. Christ is not a passive victim, but he gave himself for us. And three, under the imagery of the Old Testament sanctuary service, Christ's death is also a sacrifice which is made to God. Because remember, sin equals death. And it's the sacrifice. Blood covers the sin. That's why what was the first sacrifice done in Eden? It is when God uh, made Adam and Eve clothes, right? An animal had to die for them to have those clothes. So whenever there is sin, there has to be a blood offering to cover that. And Christ did that for us, ultimately on the cross. And finally, the sacrifice is accepted by God since it is a fragrant offering. Right, it's a it's a um, it, a sweet smelling offering. If you go back to Exodus twenty nine verse eighteen, it says, "And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord." So here we have um, Paul is trying to to teach us you know, how we are to live. Ultimately, we all want to live wise, right? We want, we want to be wise according to uh, the Bible, not according to the world. What, what the, the world says is wise ultimately leads to debt, uh, unhappiness, um, and, and all, all kinds of manner of debauchery. So forget about what the world teaches. We need to find out 
what the Word of God teaches. If you go to Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You know, so Paul has identified those who practice various sins without shame or repentance. He calls them the sexual, sexually immoral or impure or, or covetous, right? Um, and... You know, he offered a blunt assessment. Those who are in Christ and destined to be participants in his future kingdom should act, not act like those who are not. And he now worries over the effect of empty words. That is, believers might be deceived by um, explicit language into thinking that whatever sin they're doing is not taboo because it's not taboo according to the standard of the world we live in today. But we as Christians do not judge our morals or, or what is right or wrong based on the world we're living in in 2023. It's the standard that God has set from eternity. What God says is good is good forever. And you can't allow the world to say, oh, it's okay. Listen, if God calls homosexuality is sin you can't then turn around and say well it's 2023 and we have different ideas so it's not a sin anymore it's a sin forever if God says it is you know Paul is warning us because of it, it's a deception people are being deceived because is it not other church members telling people this? Of course it is. Is it not uh, church members that are, are marrying homosexuals in the church? Absolutely. Welcoming them in the church? Absolutely. Hanging their degenerate flag outside the church? Absolutely. So remember, we have to go to a thus saith the Lord, and we have to pray and ask for discernment. Don't rely on other people to give you their opinion on what the Bible says. That's never a good idea. God will lead you into truth and understanding. He will bring you out of darkness and into light. Because there are many people out there that they want something to be true and they twist the Bible to, to make it so. Now, if we go to Ephesians, um, so we're staying in Ephesians 5. Let's go to 11, 11, uh, where do I want to, yeah, 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. So here we have um, Paul is saying that we need to expose the evil. Right? Let's continue in verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake uh, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So he's saying these people that are living in darkness, they're dead. They're dead to truth. They're dead to the light. And listen, I've met many people like that. that they're locked into what they believe, and they refuse to budge. They, they don't even uh, want to talk about it anymore. Now, I myself um, am settled in, in many doctrine, but I'll still talk to you about it. I'll still go into the Bible and let's, let's discuss it, and I'll show you why I believe, I believe the way I do. And for me, it's always a thus saith the Lord. You know, I, I'm, I'm not smart enough to come up with my own uh, truth, my own religion. I'm, I'm just better off following the wisdom and truth that God has. Because at the end of the day, he's a lot wiser and smarter than me. So it's, it's the Holy Spirit that we're going to seek out um, to, to understand what is truth and what is error. So we need um, to be um, children of the light. And, and the whole point of doing it is 
that the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, right? That's Ephesians 5, 9. Paul is advocating a strategy of showing forth God's goodness. Believers are to express the unfruitful works of darkness by exhibiting the righteous alternative for all to see. So people who are, are doing this debauchery say, hey man, don't you want to get right with God? Yeah, I want to get right with God. They say that. Okay, well, you're living with your girlfriend. Marry her, and then you'll be right with God. Then what you're doing, you're not living in sin anymore. Okay, yeah, I can do that. So we we need to um, show people how they can change their life from being um, sinful to being righteous. And remember, the righteousness comes from Jesus Christ because he is our... Uh, guide but people think that oh you know Christians um, lives are boring it's it's not boring man living for God is exciting understanding and reading the Bible and getting new truths and applying it to your life and the daily struggle that we face because Satan is coming up with new ways to get you to sin it's not boring. And, and when you uh, associate yourself with other Christians and you edify one another and you speak with one another and you lift each other up, that's exciting stuff. And as we go out and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others and we see that their life has changed, that's exciting. And as we go on a hike and as we, we're not just hiking just to, for exercise, but we see um, the creative hand of God in nature, that's exciting and in our children. Listen, all the things that God has ha, had planned from the beginning that we do now, it, it leads to a more satisfying life. It, it leads to a life that is, is going to lead to eternal happiness and not just this temporary happiness that these other people find. Now, Ephesians 5.14 is talking about that people need to wake up. This, this language is associated with the resurrection of the dead. And it's, it's because people are in a spiritual slumber. And they need to experience the transforming presence of Christ. And a lot of people who maybe they were once Christians, they're backslidden, or they need to wake up and understand the times we're living in. The whole world is against us. The government, the politicians, the news, everybody is against us. That's why we need to stand up. Because if you're just going to fight for the, the crumbs from the table of the elites, then your life is not going to be satisfying. But if you understand that Jesus is coming soon and we need to endure to the end, and then one day God is going to take us to heaven and then eventually recreate a new heaven and a new earth for us to live, that's exciting then that gives new meaning to life. It's not about climbing the corporate ladder and getting a new car and a new house. It's not about that. It's about surviving and witnessing and sharing. God will provide your needs. And he will take care of you. And he will help you because judgment day is coming for everybody who has offended God's people. You know, as believers look toward the return of Christ, you know, we live in a difficult time. You know, even one in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul portrays as uh, a hazardous but rewarding marketplace. And we need to remember that if we live for God and not for ourselves, then at the end we will be justified and we will be rewarded because Jesus says, I bring my reward with me to those who have been faithful. But what we need to do is we need to replace self with the spirit. We need to be filled with the spirit, right? That's what it said in Ephesians 5.18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. And because the spirit is, is going to nourish us. And you know what? It stands in contrast to what the, the pagan is filling himself with, which is alcohol and junk food and whatever else that's going to destroy his body. 
But we understand that our body is the temple of the living spirit. And we're not going to put in it things that are going to damage our body. So we must um, turn from the ways of darkness. Right? We're going to rebuke it with our life. Our life is going to stand as a testament to what somebody living for Christ can be like. So when the rest of your coworkers are complaining, you're going to be in gratitude. When, when people are saying, oh, you know, the bosses, they get to take Monday off. Well, it, because it's a holiday this Monday, Labor Day. But I got to work. Listen, that's okay. It's a blessing to work. It's a blessing to make money. Just be thankful that you can work. There are many people that are unemployed. You know, my wife, she's from South Africa. There, there, there's many people in South Africa that would love to be working, even overtime hours, because they're struggling to make ends meet. So we need to have an experience of gratitude in everything. And when we do that, we'll have a different take on life. Let's read another Bible verse. I want to go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 42, 16. It says, I will lead the blind by the way they did not know. I will guide them on unfamiliar paths. I will turn darkness into light before them and rough places into level ground. These things I will do for them and I will not forsake them. This is, has to be our commitment to the lost in this world. We are, they are blind. Listen, my family is blind to what's going on in this world today. They trust the government. And I'm sorry, we, we, can, we cannot trust the government. The government does not have our best interest ever, whether it's secular people, uh, spiritual people, it doesn't matter. They're only about their own power and their own wealth, and they use us to their own ends. What we need to care about is the other workers, other common everyday folk like us. We need to worry about them who are trapped, who are trapped in, in, the, in the CNN bubble, who are trapped in, in the selfish bubble, who are trapped in, in all these things that are just leading them down the road of, of destruction. We have to, to lead them in the ways that they did not know. But the only way that we can do that is for us to live a life that is not hypocritical. Because the biggest stumbling block for non-Christians is hypocritical Christians. And I see it every day in the news. Brothers and sisters, we have to live the life that we are calling other people in to live. And we need to, to be wise. That's what the Bible is teaching us. That, that we have this wisdom and this knowledge, but we have to apply it to our life. And when we do that, we will be a testimony. Our life will be a testimony to others. The wisdom of the Bible is, is in direct opposition to the wisdom of the world. So if you find yourself living a life that, that is a little bit worldly, a little bit spiritual, you got to get out of the world. You got to get fully 100% committed full time into the spiritual. Live for God 100%. You know, there was a funny um, church sign that I read. I think I said it before where it said that God doesn't want weekend visits. He wants full-time custody. That's what we need to give him. And when we allow the wisdom of the Bible to penetrate our hearts and our minds, then, then we will be better soul winners and we will be able to lead people out of darkness because we ourselves um, have a story to tell and truth always um, will will trump uh, lies because lies can be refuted. We can show you this is not true. So let's pray. Let's pray that God will bless each and every one of us. Pray that God will help us along our, our walk and that we will draw near to him every day. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God that leads and directs our path. Thank you for the wisdom and truth that is found in your Holy Bible. Please help us to rebuke the world, to not be a part of it, to flee from it, 
and to draw near to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone, you have a blessed week coming up, and we'll see you right back here next time. God bless.